Yep. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the episode of Realism, and I am here with none other than Tijuana Mamarazzi Hardwell. Thank you did so I much get for that having right? me. I yeah, you did. Right. you did. You got it right. Hey. So did. for those of you that don't know, Mamarazzi Magazine is very well known here in the community. I applaud you for everything that you give to the community. You you were you were a voice for the community before the community voice. Thank you. I can you. say it like that. Thank you. And you, you work very hard in making sure that our culture is seen because... I feel like I don't I don't know your age personally and I'm not asking you that, but I feel I'm like I'm proud you, of being thirty two. I'm thirty two. There it is. I'm a proud 32. So I feel like you make sure that whatever is going on in the city, it gets heard. Yeah. And I really want to know how did how did that passion start? So what a lot of people don't know is that um, at age 14, I was a grassroots community organizer. And a lot of people later know that Barack Obama, he was a grassroots community organizer also. So I cared a lot about the community. Um, I was very involved in my community. Uh, we were advocating for street lights uh, because we saw the correlation between the crime um, and such. And I had a platform even then uh, to be able to highlight the community leaders, but also I was very much interested in this local independent um, independent musician scene. So I wanted to really merge them together. I mm -hmm. felt as though me just being a lover of music, um, but also caring very much about the community, I wanted to bring those two ideas together. I feel as though it's almost like, it's almost like bait. You might wanna go find out a little more about a local artists, mm -hmm. um, but also being able to have community put in there too. And so um, my very first magazine was actually a black and white. It was called From the Streets was the name of it. Um, I was actually able to get that funded by a grant. And so that was my very first thing that I ever did. And the artist on my cover was actually XV. Hmm. It was his very first interview and it was my first interview. How, but how do you, did you just naturally have the passion for it? as far as interviewing, because you tell me like, this started at like 14. Yeah. How, how did you get interested even in that program? Was that something that your parents got you into or? No, were so. You, were you that kid that grew up watching <laughs> interviews by people and watching like MTV Cribs, like learning behind the scenes? You know, stuff? I really, in order to pinpoint it, I really don't know, but I, Loved watching MTV, loved watching BET. Mm -hmm. um, but I would probably, if I had to pinpoint knowing that I would do this, it was probably Sister to Sister magazine. Mm. Uh, Jamie Foster Brown was someone who I really, really looked up to. And not only would she do these, um, not only would she do these interviews in which, you know, she'd do the articles, but she would also do the transcription interviews. So you'd find out what she asked them and how they answered. Um, and I really loved and admired that. And so it was something, it was a style of journalism that I liked and decided to, to really follow. So. so you were influenced from sister to sister. So mm -hmm. now that you are a independent black woman, with her own magazine. How does it feel knowing that you have sparked something and possibly a young woman or a young girl that is 14, 13 years old, the same way that that magazine mm -hmm. inspired you? Um, you know, I do get a lot of feedback, um, whether it's someone who's wanting to be in front of a camera or someone who wants to write or someone who wants to write within the magazine. And they'll tell me that I inspire them. And that's always um, an awkward. I'm not comfortable. It's always awkward to hear that because I'm not really comfortable with that burden of responsibility uh, that people are looking to the things that you're doing. Um, they're gravitating towards it. And. I just, I'm, I'm not comfortable but just yet with being so well. able to be See, told you get that, your flowers so. today. Yeah, that's, I appreciate that's, that. That's one thing I'm gonna make sure today is that you get your flowers. Thank you. Because not only do you carry, your, you carry yourself in such a professional way, but mm -hmm. you do everything to, at the best of, your best ability. Yeah, I and really I try to. I don't, I don't really know, you know what I'm saying, like, who's your team? You know what I'm saying? Do you mm -hmm. have a team behind you on Mama Rossi or is it just you? So I, um, I don't, it, I think my team is people who just support me through shares. There's people who I have never met ever who always share whatever I post. Um, 
of course, you know, my best friend, Danielle Johnson, mm. she's someone who is has always been a soundboard for me. So when I'm thinking about doing this hot, controversial interview, I always be like, girl, what do you think about this? And she's like, girl, are you really going to do that? And I'm like, yeah, I, I think I really should. Um, and so she's always been a soundboard for me. Um, it's just so many amazing people. Brave Films is super supportive and they've always been supportive of the Mamarazzi brand. Mm. Um, DJ3 is someone who, um, when I very first decided to launch the magazine, he was someone who uh, would bring me in, paid me from the very, very beginning in order to promote um, at the clubs, any type of events that he was doing, any concerts. But he also was like, hey, do you want to interview with so-and-so? And that's crazy. He, he did that, like completely believed in me um, and allowed me to be able to do that. I didn't have to beg for an interview or anything. He just very much walked me uh, towards it and was like, hey, you know, I'll line this up. So I've interviewed Scrappy. Um, I was actually there when he got the call from Love and Hip Hop in order to be on the show before he was ever Crazy. on there. So, and, you, and, you and that was something that they that linked. Yeah, I couldn't share it and that was super hard. Um, but even though he didn't make me sign no contract, I really should have. Did you think about leaking it? <laughs> I thought about leaking it. If you if you could go back now, would you have leaked it? I would have leaked it. Woo! I would have. And I know that some people might not agree with that, but I would have definitely leaked it because that's what journalism is, yeah. you know, found out about it. And you, you know, respectfully so. didn't come, you know, didn't put that out there. I think it was less about my respect for Scrappy. And that's not to say I don't respect Scrappy, but it was less about my respect for Scrappy and more about my relationship with, you know, with uh, with DJ three and them who brought Scrappy. So okay. it was kind of like I didn't want to create this engine because I, I know that sometimes they bring those artists back so I didn't want to I didn't want to burn a bridge I got you yeah, so but I would definitely have done it, it if I could do it all over again I know you would because <laughs> I would I leaked that yeah. so fast yeah but at 32 years old and I'm not gonna say your age anymore the rest of this interview I'm proud. look I'm proud do you know um, how many people are not making it to 30 I'm proud facts, of my age facts. look but we know what's going on you're so young and you're a veteran at this like, you know what I'm saying? I, I, res I respect the hell out of you. Thank you. Like, I you really know, appreciate 100%. that. hundred percent. And my question for you is, and I feel like there's a lot of us now that are in the media scene in mm -hmm. Wichita. Because before, when you started, I'm sure there wasn't these many platforms. There. When I started, um, the community voice existed. Um, Benita Gooch uh, with her publication. And I think that she had just started beginning to interview uh, local musicians, but it wasn't so much like the rappers, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then ICT Hip Hop was going and, you right. know, and they did that kind of blog style. Um, and so that's what I knew when I very first came onto the music scene. Mm -hmm. um, so to be able to see that there are so many different hubs some might think like, you know, does that make you feel, you know, any kind of way? I think that it's great for the scene. Um, Wichita is not Chicago. We are mm -hmm. not New York. We're not Dallas, you know, and those other cities, those bigger cities, they have many different outlets. Right. And I am not offended by the fact that, you know, that I'm in good company with, you know, with other uh, bloggers, writers, uh, people doing interviews, podcasts. So yeah. I think it's in, in, in good sport. So, so my question for you is, how important is it to only the first impression of meeting someone? Oh, it's super important. Mm -hmm. It's super important. There are people, and I'm guilty of this, but there are people who I had such a bad first impression that <laughs> I keep a distance from them. I'm good. I'm good. Um, but, but there are some people who, you know, they have a really, really bad, bad first impression mm -hmm. and unless that second when you come through with that second impression you, really gotta, impress me. you gotta impress me yeah facts 100 percent. <laughs> yeah so I, I definitely think and i hope that anytime anyone has uh you know has met me that it's always been a pleasant experience that i've always been supportive warm and welcoming um i will say i'm guilty of the fact that there have been some people who have perceptions of me before they meet me um and it's always really crazy when they do meet me and they're like hey you're super laid back and cool um and that made me realize, like, what am I putting out on Facebook? Okay, so I'm ready to share with okay. you now. It's my first impression of you. So this was my first interview, and I was telling my wife about this as I was getting ready. This is my first interview where I was kind of nervous. What? 
Yeah. And the reason why is because you do what I do. Yeah. You do what I do to the level that I want to get to. Thank you. And so my expectations for getting in this interview and, you know, finding out who Tijuana really is, yeah. that was like a mission. It's a mission yeah. for me. You know what I'm saying? I want people to really, you know, know. Yeah. And when I see you, I see you on the professional side. Yeah. So I'm like, I really asked Troy. I told Troy, <laughs> I said, I'm not showing up in basketball shorts and a t-shirt this interview. Like, I got to be really like, I want to be like, is this, you're going to get the most professional out of me. So I want to talk about the hats that you wear because mm -hmm. you do a lot of things. Yeah. So what? What exactly does Tijuana Mama Razi Harwell do? So I do teach over at um, over at Heights High School, and hey, so Hollywood yeah, Heights. so I teach an employability course there. Um, so that's what I do. That's my bread and butter, essentially. That's but, dope, though. But yeah, but I'm also an entrepreneur. So um, what a lot of people might not know is I do a lot of behind the scenes work with artists. My name doesn't have to be attached to it. I don't have to be right out front. Um, but I do provide all kind of PR services mm -hmm. for artists. And I like to do, I don't even always promote that kind of stuff because I find that I don't always have the time. But if an artist wants me to, you know, to do a write up on them or to help market and promote them or give them Word you know, on the advice, street is you're a good them. publicist. Thank you. You're a really Thank good you. Publicist. Thank you. For those yeah. of you that don't know, <laughs> she was a publicist for XV at one point. So an unofficial We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna yeah. talk about it. So that's one hat that you wear. We talked about the school and we talked about that. What else do you do? Um, so I also do real estate. Um, you know, I was someone who I really believe in, uh, you know, buying back the block. That whole concept about in order to gain back control and power, you know, that we have to begin to be homeowners, property owners. Yes. We have to, to own some land. Like that's super important. And through real estate, um, it's just further like reaffirmed my beliefs on how important it is for people who look like me to mm -hmm. be able to start. We, we need to own some yes. shit. Yes, <laughs> yes we do, 100%. Um, let's get into that a little yeah. bit about the uh, real estate. Mm -hmm. What is What are some things that you see young first time black homeowners, what are some things that they might get discouraged about in that, you know, owning their home? I think for um, for so many young people in general, we already struggle with credit and yeah. <laughs> we struggle with yeah. credit um, for a lot of us. Our families did not teach us mm -mm. how to. Um, and I'd be amiss if I did not point out the fact that in a lot of uh, African-American families, we do not have generational wealth. No. Um, it's a real issue. Um, and it's a lot to even talk about in just in just it's, one it's, interview. It's but it is a. Um, it's, it's almost like a cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we don't pass on anything to our kids, if we don't have properties to pass on to them, if we don't have houses, it's a big issue. And She's so with talk. me getting into real it. estate and being an entrepreneur, it's important. I'm a, I'm a single mom to a 12 year old. <laughs> it is important for me when I think about my legacy, I want to have her remember, you know, the great relationship and bond that we have but I also want her to be able to have something that is going to make her money without her having to clock in. And if I don't do that, then I fail. In my personal opinion, I have failed. If I do not break the cycle, yes. you know, my parents uh, were homeowners. We don't have that home that we grew up in. For me, I have to make sure that, you know, before I leave this earth, that my daughter has something, you know, a business that she can inherit, mm -hmm. uh, property that she can inherit, some kind of wealth that she's going to be better for. She's going to be able to be further ahead, right. uh, you know, than others. That's super important to me. That's the goal. I feel that it should be for a lot of parents. And I don't yeah. think they think about the circumstances or situation that they put their children in. Yeah. The yeah. goal should always be for my child to elevate yeah. and be better than what I was or what I have. Yeah. Yep. So it's so what I'm seeing with young people is that we don't know how to make credit work for us. Yes. Um, I'm not still learning us about that. credit. Yeah. Not you're not learning about credit. Um, we're not learning about um, avoiding payday loans, um, which is really they prey on people who it's, look like me and you. It's shocking, though, yeah. because like I've never been in that situation yeah. as far as, you know, those loan places yeah. and stuff like that, because it's something about it to me that I'm like, 
okay, I'm going to go get $300 to go buy this TV. <laughs> but by the time I'm done paying it off, I'm going to have paid them $1,200. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's something. But a lot of people think about that money right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and to be honest with you, we can sit here and talk about how irresponsible it is to, you know, to rack up a credit card bill or to, uh, to mismanage or to have to go get payday loans. And I used to be one of those people who are like, you know, people who do that are super irresponsible, but there is no limit that you will not do to put food on the table of your kids. There is no limit that you wouldn't go in order to make sure that you keep That's a roof on your kids' head. That's very and true. so I think about the fact that again, it's a thing of generational wealth. Many Many people have not planned for if you lose your job today, how yes. are you going to survive for the next two or three months? Yes. A lot of people have not. And I don't think it's just an African-American issue. I think that that's an issue in general that people, we think about the fact that COVID-19 hit, all right? And how many businesses went, went under because we, they could not learned, sit down for yeah. two or three months. We learned real quick that, that, our, that our country can't shut down for a month yeah. or two. And, that, and now, and wait a minute, I, I wait a minute, a wait a minute. Re that. repeat that. Cause it's that part. They realized, they didn't realize that our country couldn't shut down for two yeah. or three months. Yep. Yeah. That they, that we don't have any money yeah. in the stash to do this or whatever. And they gave us $1,200. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> on, on top of hand, trying to hand out money when the it's already, you know, tolling so fast. It's just, I don't know. I, I think that, we learn we if you're paying close attention, you learn that America is just like us. Yeah, they're in the same position as us. Cause it was I, a reminder. Uh, yeah, I've heard someone say before, and I think it was a Jay Z line, and it says something about um, if you don't have a thousand dollars, or if you don't have, if you can't, if you can't pay your next month's rent yeah. or something like that yeah. in advance or whatever, you you're not doing right. Yeah, yeah, and. That's tough. It's true. It's tough because a lot of us are living nine to five. Mm -hmm. Nine to yeah. five. And a lot of us are parents, single parents, and you don't realize how much work it takes into a child. Yeah. Lord have mercy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's breaking that cycle. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I'm really nobody's employee. Nah. And I know that. I don't consider it like... I, Self made. Yeah. And so, you know, even though I do really, really good in my job, it's not my goal to be there forever. It's no. just not. Um, I know that about myself that that I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a I'm a real entrepreneur. I have, you know, started you know, I'm too damn smart. <laughs> I'm too damn smart. God bless me with too good of a mouthpiece yeah. for somebody to be representing yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And I think for me also, I think I struggle with, uh, you know, I struggle with even being in positions where I don't want to be there anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and nothing like a nine to five and having to provide for your child or provide for yourself, you know, puts you in a limbo where you have to go into a job that you hate. That's not me. Mm -hmm. I cannot go into a job that I do, that I do not like, which I love my job now, but I I've been there, done that, going into jobs that you hate, that were toxic. We always talk about toxic relationships, toxic friendships. People don't want to talk about that toxic workplace that, yeah, they pay you and they're, they're the reason that you, you know, can put food in your mouth, but it's still toxic. That, that talk is real mm -hmm. when they say, you know, oh, you go to work and mm -hmm. you deal and put up with all this and all that, yeah. and then you go home and not to bring that home. Mm -hmm. Like that... It's all a lot. A lot of negative energy yep. comes from the places that we work around or that we work who we work yep. with. Yeah, that's real bad. And so for me, that really motivated me to save. I want to. I know that this is bad because I teach employability skills, but I want to know that the moment that I am fed up at a job, I can walk out and I'm still going to be good. I have to have that type of comfort. I have to have that type of uh, security and peace of mind. And because of that, I can say that, you know, in my 30s, I save. I, I save. I wasn't doing that in my 20s. I love it. I was not doing that in my 20s, but in my 30s, I'm definitely doing that. Black people, we need to hear this. Mm -hmm. We need to hear this. And hearing it from me, from a successful black woman Thank you. is also an amazing thing. But tell me what Tijuana is like as a mom. You said you have a 12 year old. Mm. What, 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 what do you, what are you? I'm are, fun. I'm a fun mom. Are you that in your face mom? Like, um, I, don't, I mean, like the, <laughs> the goofy mom, the, you know, always trying to hang out with her friends. 
So my daughter loves, she loves everything that I do. So, um, you know, she has that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, you know, even more than what I did at her age. Um, so I'm a fun mom. I, and my daughter, I cannot have a better daughter because we really complement each other so well. She's a go-go kid. She, she, she wakes up in the morning, I'm telling you. When, when everything shut down and I had to work from home, that meant nothing to her. It was like, what are we doing today? And I'm like, I'm working. She's like, uh, well, how long you gotta work? Because you know, I'm trying to go do this. Um, but I'm also like that too. I'm always, I'm wanting to create, we're not materialistic people. I feel that. Me and my daughter, we're not materialistic at all. We care about like, you know, making memories. Where are we going to go? What are, where are places that we can go? What are things that we can do? So I'm that kind of mom, but I'm also the kind of mom that she does not mind me being around her friends. Um, you know, she, I make her friends laugh, so I have a really good sense of humor. So I know a lot of people think that I'm serious all the time. I'm not. I'm really not. All right, I let I loose. I, I have a lot of. Fun. I want to see Tia want to ride in the car and, and her and her song come on. What's your song that we're doing? Car Carrier. Right now, it's Beyonce's Black Parade. All right, they so I'm really out. loving. Yeah, I'm loving that one. Um, but yeah, we listen to all kind of music, and you know, look, don't judge me, but I listen to the baby. Now, now I can't always listen to that with my twelve year old. <laughs> I'm shocked you didn't get that interview. Uh, with the baby, uh -huh. yeah, you know, yeah, it don't always happen that way to where you get every single interview. But I'm really grateful for the interviews that I've had. But, but yeah, just me as a mom, I'm always like speaking life into my daughter. Um, you know, I am teaching her much like my parents taught me. Don't take just anything off of anybody. Right. And so, like that is something that my parents taught me um, that I have wanted to make sure that I teach my daughter. So mm. she's very much like this. She ain't taking nobody's stuff. I feel you. She ain't taking nobody's stuff. So yes, yeah, so I think that's the kind of mom that I am. And she's, she's uh, when I do Mamarazzi Mondays, she'll go and make sure that I have a drink there. She sets up my lights and my camera. Oh, like, she got an assistant. Yeah, my daughter Dang. really is like an assistant. She should, like, she should be getting this credit. She really, yeah, I gotta give her, you know, I gotta give my daughter her flowers because for what I'm able to do is because I have a kid who's so, um, she just goes with the flow. Um, she does such a great job of even keeping me on my toes. Like she's the one who, I used to have a horrible punctuality issue. I used to be like late to a lot of stuff. My daughter, she sees how stressed I was getting when I was like late all the time. So she's just someone, hey, this is what time it is. Like she's just like, hey, Hey, you need to hurry up. You got this is. Yeah, she'll tell me something like, I guess you're not doing your makeup because you still in the shower. <laughs> and Dang. she's like, you know, Tommy's right. Like, she calls yeah, you out. Yeah, she calls me out. But she's a Sagittarius. She's a real one. Yeah, she is. So she's a Sag and her grandpa is a Sag. And I think they're very much alike. But but she stays on me like that. Um, but yeah, she's she's great. She really is like having an assistant because yeah, she's always like, hey, what meetings do you have today? What interviews do you have today? But she loves it. Mm -hmm. You know, she loves it. Is um because you're you're consistent, you know, through the every year, school mm -hmm. year. And I'm yeah. I'm sure that, you know, you bring in and adopt, you know, certain kids that you know are in your program mm -hmm. and stuff and you guys grow relationships because I've seen yeah. you shout out a bunch of kids yeah. recently, yeah. you know, for graduating yeah. and other proud things of like that. One hundred percent. Is it hard sometimes that you know once they're leaving the nest? Yeah. How yeah. what's what's how hard is that? Because it, you have to go through it every year. Yeah. And I don't think we get to ask because you know just like through the year we build a relationship with the yeah. teachers. The teachers build a you know they they build a relationship with the students. I would do this job of teaching young people if I was not getting paid for it. I would do it still. Um, that's a good I question believe to, ask, in, to ask yeah. yourself too, as far as the career you want to do. Yeah, I would, and I think that that's what's kept me in this position for as long as I have, even with me pursuing real estate and doing everything else that I do. What's really kept me is not because, oh, this is what I have to do for a livelihood. I love what I do. Um, and so when school shut down, you know, we, thought that we were going away and having some fun during spring break and I really needed that. Didn't think it was gonna be. But when we found out that school was like let out for the rest of the school year, mm -hmm. that's when I realized how connected I was with those students. So immediately when that happened, I thought about my students who I worried about whether or not they were left at home by themselves for long periods of time. I mean, yeah, they're high school, but I knew that there was one of my students who her mom traveled. 
she was a, you know, she was a trucker. Uh, she would hang with her trucker boyfriend. I knew that this girl was at home all the time by herself. Um, and so I checked on her very, very often. And it was like, you know, and the more kids are by themselves, the more yeah. chances they have to get into trouble. Yep, absolutely. So I worried about her. I worried about some students who I knew um, might have had a issue, especially with school being out and not having a way to be able to get like food and that kind of stuff. So I went and I, you know, I went and I was dropping off food and I was doing this kind of stuff. And I don't say that for like, you know, for the accolades or anything no. like that. But it's just the fact that like you really pour into these kids so much, but they pour into you. Yeah. So um, how you think about the young people and you worry about them and you want them to make good, healthy decisions. Yes. Um, I know sometimes like when we see, when we find out in the media, like, there's some young kid who was like robbing a convenience store or, um, you know, a gunfight or a fight and all that. other side of this. People, people tend to think, oh, you know, he was 16. He knew better. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, she was 17 and, and, sh and she knew better. I promise you, I will never, ever say those things again, because being in a classroom with those kids Monday through Friday, you start realizing even at 17, they have not figured it out. Mm -mm. And I think about myself. I became a mom at 20. And that might not be young to some people. That was young. That's still, that's young. That was young. That's I don't care young. what nobody said. People yeah. are just like, that's oh, a baby you, at least you were Yeah, people will be like, at least you weren't in high school. And I'm like, look, I. You still trying to figure yourself out, though. That's I didn't have a lot of life for. skills. I did not have a lot of life skills. I'm telling you, my, I, I essentially grew up with my daughter, you know, like going through like the fire, mm -hmm. you know, with my daughter. Just really, um, for me, it. It matured me in a lot of ways. It matured me in a lot of ways. And that brings you guys closer yeah. also. Because when you guys are growing together, you know, growing up together, it's like, you know, she sees the work that oh, yeah. mom is putting in. Oh, yeah. And it's almost like that's when you have a kid that appreciates oh, you. Oh, yeah. That's, She's that's, super appreciative. That's what I'm trying to get to. She's Mom super appreciative. Kids, boy. But at one point in time, I was that mom who I was spoiling her. Like, if she broke something, whether it was a toy or something that I spent a lot of money on, you know, I, I had that kid who was like, oh, don't worry. Don't worry about it, mom. Don't, don't stress about it. You can just buy me another one. Nah. Nah. Look, I'm telling you, but she, I had to break her out of doing that, but that's who she was. She, that's who she was. But now it's, you know, let me be more cognizant about how we spend money because now it's like the the goal is, you know, the goal is on ownership and, mm. and doing other things. So and, she gets the picture now. And parents don't realize that they do it sometimes because, you know, like, I'm not I'm not judging you for that yeah. because I'm going through that. I have yeah. an eight-year-old. You <laughs> know what I'm hard. saying? Like, you have a 12-year-old. You know, yeah. you're like, I had to get her out of yeah. that. I have to get my child out of that because that's, that's kind of what we have to go through when we're raising our kids, yeah. trying to give them the life that we didn't have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not saying, you know, we we grew up, you know, struggling, not having anything. But you know what I'm saying? You always want your kid, their life to be elevated, mm -hmm. to yeah. be a level up. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so a lot of people don't know this about me, but I am actually the second of seven of my parents' kids. Second my, of my seven. parents. It was a lot of love. All right. So before before it went to hell in a handbasket, my parents had seven kids together and my dad, um, you know, had a he had a, another one too and so <laughs> mom if you're watching this please like skip over this part it's gonna be a trigger moment for her okay <laughs> all right but but my whole point is this um you know so we we grew up in a household and i don't recall us you know much going without my parents you know made sure of that but I do think that we could have had other experiences if there were not so many kids. And I know that there's people who have a lot of kids and they still making it happen. I'm just saying my reality is that it kind of programmed in me that I wanted to have more experiences with my daughter. I wanted to be able to give her one, more one-on-one -on -one time. I feel you. You know, so. I feel you. So with me having just her, you know, she gets to benefit. She gets to benefit from that. But she has a bunch of cousins. We have a real big family. so. She didn't want no additional she good. kids. She was she good. She good. She's not one of those kids who's just like you know. Oh, and I know I she got her. a cousin and she's like this. With. <laughs> she, oh, she, she probably got a couple of. Them. That's how my son <laughs> she is. Does. Like I have an eight year old son and then I have a two year old daughter. She yeah. just turned two. Yin and yang. Yeah. It's like when they get together, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so with that, I mean, just yeah. how I parent is a little different than how my parents uh, parented. My dad, I never remember him giving us a whooping ever, but he was one of them who would like lecture you for hours yeah, like long talk yeah long long talk so i kind of do that with my Have daughter tear in your eyes when you yeah. walk away yeah. yeah and i'm telling you he used to ask for us to 
come up with their own punishment. And Ooh. see, now my mama, she ruled by the belt. All right, but my dad, he grew up different. You gotta have both sides. Yeah. It balances out. So yeah, so my dad, my dad wasn't the one to like whoop us or anything, but my mom. She wasn't uh, was playing. My mom. She was about that. Mama yeah. was OG. She wasn't playing. Yeah, but I think I probably lean a lot more towards my dad to where, like, I'll talk to my daughter about stuff. Your daughter at that more. age now, yeah. a whooping, whooping with her, yeah. where are you out? I ain't got time for that. <laughs> Once they hit about seven, it's like, I ain't got time for all that trying to whoop you. And she's fast. She's an aspiring track star. Look, I ain't oh, running. I ain't chasing, I ain't chasing her. <laughs> trying, to, trying, to, trying to cut you off between the couch and the table, tackling you and all that. No, I ain't dealing with all that. But yeah. um, over the years... You've worked with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. you've, you've worked with a lot of people. And some, when you work with a lot of people, you meet a lot of different characters, yeah. a lot of different personalities. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be kind of a downer. Yeah. Because sometimes some people aren't who you expect them to be. Oh, sometimes yeah. people's personalities just kind of rub you the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to catch yourself not having a dislike towards people. Yeah. And kind of, you know isolating yourself from people mm -hmm. how how is it that you've been able to kind of balance that because you've been doing this for some years now yeah me i'm getting to the point i get tired of people yeah it's so <laughs> you'll you'll see me like people ask me like hey what you doing rello at home like <laughs> i'm chilling at my house troy call what you doing rello at home like i don't yeah. like going out for me i'm a huge extrovert but one thing that i started um realizing years ago and i wouldn't just put this in uh, as it relates to the music scene, I just think life in general or even a workplace, even the people who you dislike or you don't gel well with, they have some strengths and qualities that you might not have. Yeah. And so when I think about my rapport with people, I think about what their strong skills are. Um, you know, what are they really, really good about? Mm -hmm. um, I value people for who they are. I don't try to make someone something that they're not. Um, I, I say this quite often, but we got to move out of a place of allowing people to disappoint us. Yeah. You know, we yeah. have to like really, really move out of a place of allowing people to disappoint us or even setting them up to disappoint us. Um, there's people who I would never ask a, a favor from, or I would never, you know, ask for them to help me with certain projects because, you know, and I know that you'll eventually have these experiences too. All right. Yeah. Because eventually the word gets out about these people. You know, you don't have to be the one going and like talking crap about people. I'm telling you the information that comes to you, the information that comes to you on these people. And I hope that people always have amazing and great things to say about me. Mm -hmm. And I try to make sure that I'm always treating people with respect the way that, that I want to be. Uh, but I'm also, I'm not perfect. I know that there are probably times where I have amazing follow through, but I know that there are times that, uh, that I've probably disappointed someone because there was something that they wanted from me. Being that, you know, that people, and, and this is where going back to, you know, people putting you on that pedestal and people saying such amazing things. Well, there's been several times where someone has contacted me in order to make their dreams a reality. My mind ain't set up like that. It's not that I can't, I will give you whatever gems you ask of me, but I might can't slow down all the way in order to help you get something off the ground. All I can hope is that you learn something from me or that you ask the right questions because that's what I had to do. Yeah. You know, I didn't have a, even though I looked up to Jamie Foster Brown of Sister to Sister Magazine, I didn't have her phone number. No. I couldn't pick up and call her or email her. I just had to study her craft and be able to take from it. And I hope that that's what people do with me. Sometimes, and again, you're going to be in this position too, Rello, but sometimes people see that you execute so well that they will try to drop something in your lap. So I now see a difference between people who want to bounce an idea off of you and people who want you to go ahead and like manifest yeah. the vision that they have, but they don't have the work ethic. Mm -mm. They don't have. That's the thing that gets me. They're not trying to put in the sweat equity. So I've just unfortunately been in situations where people will say, hey, you know, I have this idea. I want to do this. I want to do this kind of podcast or I want to do this type of interview skills. I mean, someone has literally like hopped in my inbox, ain't never done a share, ain't never supported anything that I've done. Man, and they're like, uh, hey. Wanted all the, wanted the juice. They wanted everything. And, and, and look, I don't mind giving gems. I don't mind doing that. I don't mind telling you what software I use. I don't mind any of that. But this person wanted everything. I went to, to college for this, you know? 
this person wanted everything that the Elliott School of Communication at WSU didn't talk to me. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> then I'm still paying for. But they wanted ev they wanted it you all. Put in on that? You gonna put, you know what I mean? <laughs> they wanted it all. And look, I can't give you. The, I can I give, can you, give some you some juice. But you know, like that whole look. I I used to be a huge, huge uh, Master P fan or whatever. And look. The game is to be, and I hope that it was Master P who said this, but this, you know, the, the game is to, to be sold, oh, not, not to be told. Look, correct me if that one Master P who said that, yeah. But, um, <laughs> somebody gonna put it in the comments. <laughs> somebody gonna put it in the comments. They gotta be like, that wasn't even him. Maybe it was Snoop. I don't know. Maybe it was during the time that he was with, with No Limit. It was, a you were no, you were no, <laughs> no Limit, you know, baby. You grew up in that No Limit I era. Am. Remember when you had to choose between whether or not you were, uh, uh, you know, Cash Money or, or no, no Limit? limit. Y'all. Remember how I was you, no you limit, remember, you remember how many daggone mixtapes came out that we forget about from <laughs> No Limit? No Limit was coming out with at least five projects a week. Man, the movies that Master P was coming out with. The vision that he had early is yeah. crazy, and he still, yep. he still yeah. has the vision. He's he's he trying to instill it in the youth now, but. It's sometimes hard, like, the youth take it weird from the OG. He doesn't get the respect that I think that he should have gotten. No. But he was a pioneer. <coughs> he was a pioneer. You know, so, of course, there was, like, you know, Diddy and, and whatnot. But I'm talking about, like, literally from coming the from dirt the to be from, able yeah. to, like, to be able to do that. And the fact that he was making movies of his own. Look, I was watching the movies. You gotta put all. I didn't the, know how you, bad they were until I got older. You gotta give Master P all the respect <laughs> in the world because not only did he make movies, not only was he one of the biggest artists in, in his time, not only did he have one mm -hmm. of the biggest labels of his time, but the man played in the NBA. Yeah, you he know I didn't know that. NBA. I didn't know that at first. I didn't know that at first. Yeah, like you gotta give. You can yeah. go buy a Miller jersey. Yeah, didn't they say that he was like you know he's like one of the only like celebrities who like yes he escaped the hood so many different yes. ways yes yeah he, and he's opened the door for so many people but yeah. do you realize that that's what you've done for people as well because i don't think a Again, lot of people realize hard. all the things that you do you know what i'm saying like you can be active with the youth mm -hmm. you can get into real estate yeah. which is very very smart to get into yeah. mm -hmm. especially the black community mm -hmm. but then also be an entrepreneur like yeah. with your magazine with everything that you do with that there's so many different hats and so you that's why I, that's one thing that i love about you is that someone can see all the work that you do mm -hmm. and be so inspired you inspire me thank you i appreciate so, it i know that you inspire other people i appreciate it but you know I, I have to go on record as saying this that there's been times where you know even with doing the mamarazzi brand it's gotten tedious or maybe i had a brick wall to where it's not exciting and it's not fun anymore and then there's people like you know there's people like troy andrews who I get to watch, you know, Vibe Wichita and all that umbrella of what he's doing. And right. then that like lights a fire again, you know. Um, so to be able to see people doing so many different things, I don't see it as competition. You know, if anything, it, it it's one of those things that in turn kind of lights my candle again, mm -hmm. you know. so Because when one door yeah. opens for one of us. We yeah. all running through that door. Yeah. It's an opportunity for all of us. And we all have our own different style. That's yep. that's why, yep. like, you know, again, I'm team vibe, but there's so many different, there's so many different things right here in Wichita, and everybody just has their own style. Yeah. And you, you just, you just got to love it. 100%. Everything ain't going to be a Mamarazzi interview. Everything ain't going to be no vibe interview, okay? And so, but just appreciating, you know, for, for whatever they bring, so. So what year did Mama Rossi Magazine begin? I graduated college 2010. The next year I launched Mama Rossi, uh, 2011. Okay. Yeah, and that was really at the pushing of um, a professor over at WSU, Lou Hellman. Uh, and I just remember, I hate to admit this, but even in my college classes, I was already about the dream. I would, in the middle of his lectures, I'd be back there sketching the magazine. Um, that man, now he got on to me several times to where it was like, hey, look, it wasn't even about the grade. It was just like, are you listening? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I am listening. I'm multitasking. I wasn't listening all the time, all right? No. <laughs> I wasn't listening How all the time. How can you listen if you multitasking? <laughs> I wasn't. And so, but he took the time to come uh, and sit next to me. And he was like, what do you want to do? And I told him, and he said, okay, 
this is my thing. If you're going to do this, especially during class time, he was like, I need, I need for you to start thinking about what your brand is going to be. So he kind of, at the college level, just gave me that, like that's where my mind was. I couldn't really focus because my mind was already on knowing what I wanted if to do. If you're here, show me that you're here yeah. and that yeah. you're not back here. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to show you what you need to know. Yeah. But if you're so, you need to show it to me. Yeah. I like that. And one of the things that he told me, he said, when you're in class, he said, your presence is felt. He said, when you are not in class, your absence is felt. Yeah. That man told You're me that. Ooh, and when he told me that, not only not only was I not missing as many classes, but um, but when I was there, I, I start making it count. I start paying attention a lot more. Um, one one thing that I can attribute to, you know, to my success or me even thinking the way that I do is because along the way, I had so many people who saw something in me and like held me accountable for it, yeah. you know? So uh, what some people don't know is I had my daughter at 20, I was still in college. I did not miss a semester. I had my daughter December 10th. I was not supposed to have her until January 19th. Dang. I was super nervous you about went, that. You went through finals, weren't you? Ooh. I had my daughter on the last day of finals Ooh. in college. Yeah, yeah. So I don't advise nobody to be doing that, all right? <laughs> Ooh, but um, it was a blessing in disguise. And I just, I attribute it to, to no, nothing other than God. Um, but I worried that I would miss out on the spring semester because I was going to have her and then need to sit down for six weeks. So I was like, basically that the semester's gone. But I had her on the last day of finals in the fall. And so I had her that and break a she bit. came early. Um, but I had my daughter and did not, I, I went back didn't on the same beat. day that, that spring, I didn't skip a beat. But again, that was my family. That's why, you know, they're always going to be team Mamarazzi because, um, you know, they just supported me in doing that. And so me having a big family just really worked for me. Uh, it was a blessing. They were able to help me with my daughter, but yeah, I graduated on time. That's I graduated cool. college on time, but I'm telling you, it just really. Hey, congratulations on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. But yeah, I mean, you know, it just, it let me know that I wasn't going to let anything stop me from what I wanted to be able to pursue. But it was hard. Right. Yeah, it was I, hard. I know it was hard. I don't, look, that's why I'm on my high school students all the time. I'm on my high school students what all the time. What do you want? I'm having like transparent, like raw authentic conversations with them that they probably they're not used to hearing from a teacher mm -hmm. but when i see them going down the wrong path i sit down with them and i tell them the things that maybe the counselor is not going to tell them i tell them the things that maybe their parents they are not telling hear. them and i just let them know but i don't want to ever come from a lecture standpoint all i do is i share my story and i'm glad that you do that because you don't understand how just that one little conversation because they might not understand it just right yeah. now but a year, two years from now, that might spark something mm -hmm. or they it might inspire something yeah. for them. So I'm really glad that you have that because people don't understand that little conversation can go a yeah. long way. Yeah. But um you have you're not afraid to be vocal about how you feel. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that I love is because I take pride in that as well. Yeah. That's one thing that I tell Troy, you know, I'm just a I'm just a guy from the north side, yeah. but I want to not only represent the north side in the right way, mm -hmm. but I also want to I want to be the voice and speak out for the average Joe. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's been so much going on whether it's George Floyd, mm -hmm. whether it's Brianna, you know, whatever's been going on yeah. i feel like and i've been vocal about this that us with platforms yeah. especially us with platforms that are pushed or all or have to be driven by the black community yeah. it's our responsibility if not our duty to come out and speak on the injustice that black people and brown people go through it's our responsibility to speak out and make it aware because I saw that someone said that uh, Brianna's no longer trending on Twitter. You know, her yeah. her name is just going going with the rest. But her murders are still out. She should still be trending. It, st it yeah. should still be trending. And um, did we still talk about the George Floyd? But now that you know the rallies and everything are going mm -hmm. on, you know, it's kind of calmed down. But mm -hmm. that's when pla people like us with platforms yeah. have to come out and speak on it. Yeah. What What's your take on that? What's your, what's your opinion? Do you feel like that we have a responsibility 
if we are using, if we are, if not using the black community yeah. or are part of the black community? So, like I said, I've been a grassroots community organizer. So whether I had this platform or not, I was going to be vocal because that's just who I am. I don't think that the burden or responsibility should be put on anyone to do it. You, what you'll later find is that people are not all that knowledgeable. Now, personally, I ain't tuning into someone who is not seeking the knowledge or is not wanting to use their right. platform. Right. But they have the right not to. But I ain't, I ain't fucking with it. Yeah. You know, so I personally think it's important to make sure that you use the platform. Just think of like these devices. I, I don't even think you need a platform like what we have to be able to be vocal about what's going on. The people who are not comfortable, uh, maybe they don't want to rock the boat. Those are people who if you're on the fence, especially on in a time like this, mm -hmm. if you're on the fence and you're straddling, those are people who I, I distance myself from. And that's so, yeah, thing. to answer your question, yeah. you should be using your platform. But I also understand that not everyone wants to. And those people, I think that, I think now people are wisening up and they're starting to pay attention to that. It kind of tells me what I need to know about yeah. you, though, in a sense. Yeah. Because, you know, if you, if you have. I think so, too. If you, if you as an artist, especially a black man, mm -hmm. you're pushing this single, you're pushing this album, yep. or you're trying to go on tour, whatever it is. If you want me to support that, but you say I don't feel comfortable enough or I, I don't know exactly what to say. Like all, all it literally takes is this is wrong. I stand with I stand with my people. You know what I'm getting ready to bring up, right? This whole situation with J. Cole and No Name. All right. So I was one of the people. It's not that I was like, you know, being overly critical of J. Cole, um, because like I said, I love everything J. Cole. I haven't posted about this because I knew I was sitting down with you. Yeah. And yeah. I saw you post about it. <laughs> and so I said- I took the post down eventually. Gonna have to talk. We gotta talk about this. I'm gonna tell you why I took the post down. Because I realized that, I realized how um, things can be interpreted. And when you, when you write something, and sometimes just in art in general, sometimes you omit things and you can't always take at face value. And so, you know, so I eventually took my post down. Now, with that being said, I'm not, I'm not backtracking at all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like we needed that record right now. Okay. That record was for a different time. Okay. Um, I think that that record was for a different time. So I didn't necessarily agree with J. Cole um, putting it out. I think right now we don't need to be, and I don't think he was trying to be divisive. So let me not use that word. What, I don't, what did you get out of the record? What, what, when you, when the song ended, what did you take away from it? You know, I was one of those people who felt as though, I didn't feel like he was being disrespectful towards No Name. I don't think that he was trying to tear her down. But one thing that I found very, very problematic is for him to, to say, you know, educate me, you know, you know, tell me, you know, what it is. You're J. Cole. You're in the room with people all the time, or you have, you have the, the name recognition to be able to put yourself in the name, uh, in the room with other people. Mm. So for me, I thought it was problematic to where, now look, don't, get, don't let me get on my soapbox about this. I think that uh, oftentimes, and I don't want to say black men in general, but sometimes black men, okay. you expect women to heal you, okay. to educate you. We have to, like, that's a lot. We're in the trenches with you also. To put that burden of educating you on a person such as No Name or any other black woman, I think is is too much. Okay, so I think it's too much. I think that the information is out there. I think that he should seek it. If you're right. not educated or if you're not right. knowledgeable and therefore you're not using your platform, because we were just talking about whether or not people should be using their platform. If you're not using your platform and you're J. Cole, mm -hmm. it's a you problem. Like it's a problem. It's a problem. Okay, so I think that J. Cole is, because J. Cole is not a very vocal person. Um, J. Cole is one of those people to me that when he does an interview, mm -hmm. I listen to it. Yeah. I listen to yeah. exactly what J. Cole is trying yeah. to say yeah. because we only get that little yeah. bit and then yeah. he goes and he disappears. Yeah. I think that we don't, we have to put into consideration that these artists that mm -hmm. we, you know, we hold to a high mm -hmm. standard 
they don't know how to word exactly what they want to say. And that's the why I only, took my post down. The only way that they know how to express themselves mm -hmm. is through music. Yeah. There are some people that they they might not read up on this information, mm -hmm. but they have enough conversations and they build an idea yeah. on something. And then yeah. building off of that idea, they're going to speak on what they yeah. think. Now, if you can educate me on that, that's even better. The thing, um, as a black man, I feel like the one, one, not the one thing, one thing that a black man can do if he asks a black woman to educate him on something, that's us putting that pride down. That's not us raising that pride. That's us telling you, look, you as a black woman mm -hmm. are more educated than I am. When I listen to the J. Cole record, I felt like I heard J. Cole say, I, yes, I graduated from college, mm -hmm. but I'm not this well-educated man mm -hmm. that you think that I am. Yeah. I think that if you don't know J. Cole and I came and approached him and had a conversation mm -hmm. with him, I think J. Cole might be shy talking to me. Yeah, yeah. But if I got to know him better, then I think his mind would, you know, come out more. Yeah. Now, no name made a post where she said, and you have these rappers that are, you know, these activists and want to talk mm -hmm. about black unit and all this other stuff. But right now you're silent. Us as us as music fans, mm -hmm. we know that if you mention saying, yo, these rappers that are talking about, you know, black act, yeah. anything, there's only a so many. Mm hmm. So if you if you talking about Kendrick, then you're talking about Cole. You might be talking about Wale. Yeah. There's as far as in the mainstream, there's only so many. Yeah. So with J. Cole, when he responded, he was responding to that comment. Yeah. And he's like, yo, Queen, just hear me out. You I feel like I get inspired from what you're saying. Yeah. But there are some And that's a perspective that you, of There's something yeah. that you said that I just want to tell you, yo, like, be careful yeah. with what you're saying because it can come off because they're going to try and take you down. Yeah. Now, it would be one thing because we've seen J. Cole be very vocal about, you know, he can diss somebody yeah. quick. Mm -hmm. In that record, I don't think he was coming off disrespectful I don't, or trying to. And, and again, that's why I took down my post. I don't think that he was, and I never felt that he was trying to be disrespectful, but I realized Sometimes when I take a post down, it's not because I'm backtracking. It's because I understand that, you know, in a midst of us debating something, mm -hmm. people are taking it some kind of way, you know. So people are like, oh, well, he wasn't disrespecting her. I'm like, I never felt like he was disrespecting her. So now I'm arguing points that I wasn't making. Right. Because everybody else wants to argue about him trying to disrespect her. I did not feel that way. Mm -hmm. What I felt... And I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad hearing from a black man how you interpreted it. The fact that you were saying that he was, you know, basically swallowing his pride and asking to mm. be educated because it took me several times more before I interpreted it that way. When I initially interpreted it, I felt as though he was putting the burden and responsibility to be educated right. about all these issues on her. Right. Okay. And, and I, that's and, and where I, I had an I issue with it. I can understand that. That's where I had an issue with it. That was yeah. really my only issue with it. That I don't want our black men, I don't want our black men in the midst of us, you know, all going through this, being in the trenches together. I don't want our black men to then villainize our black women. Right. In the process. Right. I, I don't want that. So, and so, you know, for me, mm -hmm. and I don't... I don't necessarily think that he was trying to villainize her, but as I listen to it, I'm like, ah, wait a minute. Now he's, you know, putting it on her. You know, there's a problem with her queen tone. There's a problem with the, with the fact that, you know, she's using her platform in this manner and speaking out against me and criticizing me. I don't want to be criticized, but he, in you're, response, you're he criticized her. her. Right. You know, so. I, I understand that. And I'm glad, I'm glad that I didn't post anything on, because <laughs> I made one post on Facebook and it was the things that someone thought that they got out of the song. And I'm mm -hmm. like, if someone feels differently, educate me yeah. on this. Because yeah. I wanted to know from a woman's perspective, yeah. how did you take that? Yeah. Because I can only tell you from a man's perspective what I think J. Cole was trying to yeah. do. And just like 
you as a woman, you yeah. can tell me, well, if I was her, this is how I would yeah. take it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we just have to come together. We it's on my like, wish list for them to squash it and do a record I together. Think, I think it's going to happen because um, I don't know if you've seen, but Ari Lennox has been very vocal mm. about supporting No Name. Mm. And when No Name um, dropped her response record, mm. Ari Lennox was sharing that like crazy. Mm -hmm. And if all of you know, Ari Lennox is under Dreamville. So, yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I did not realize that. But J. Cole shared it. Exactly. So, you know, see, so there has to be a mutual respect. Yeah, it has to be a mutual, you know, love and, and respect. It has to be. 100%. Yeah, it has 100%. to be. 100%. So, um, tell me a little bit about what it was like being. Well, you said it was a different term, but you were at one point kind of a publicist for mm -hmm. XV. What was that kind of like? So I was not beginning? I was not his official publicist. I just did, you know, I just did a few things. Um, you know, he's someone who, as I mentioned, I was his first uh, interview and he was my first interview. And so there was an admiration that I had from for him. Um, and I think I think it was mutual. Uh, one thing that if you've ever met XV, he's that same person who he is today is who he has always been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's always been about creating. And so you cannot be in a room with someone like XV and not learn something or take something, uh, you know, from him. Now, the the PR stuff, I just think that because, again, I was not his publicist. I want to put that on record. He, he never hired me as his publicist. Uh, the PR things that I did was just out of like support okay. of an artist. This was an artist who I truly uh, believed in. Yeah, this was an artist who I believed in. And so any promotion or type of interviews or anything like that that I did with XV, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was just out of like it was support. Out of it was, it was just, yeah, love and, and support. We do, and for us that are, you know, up and coming into this world, you know, we, we do a lot for free. Yeah. Even now, yeah. people don't realize like, oh, can you do this for me? Yeah. I can charge you for this real yeah. easy. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So yep. I, it's I true. Think, I think that's really cool. These different platforms, you know, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because with these platforms, you know, we do this in order to put the city on in order to support, but I have been able to turn around and monetize it also. So the services that, that artists kept asking for me, they, maybe they needed a write up or, you know, they're getting ready to go meet with a, with a label head and all yeah. of a sudden, all of a sudden they're discovering that EPK means something, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, and I know that Troy talks about this often, but artists don't understand like the importance of a rollout, you know, for their music and stuff. Now we're able to start monetizing that. We've talked about You this. know, it can give you a headache, but if you're not willing to show an artist the ropes, then when you're a part of the problem, especially especially when you Troy Andrews and you king of marketing and production and whatnot. So that's that man. So it's like, you know, it's one of those things to where we're going to continue to grapple off of the fact that artists don't don't know how to do this and don't know how to do that. But those of us who have the eye for it, who have the knowledge, we now have to put ourselves in a position as tedious or as busy as it's going to make us. We now have to start offering those services to them so that our artists can be able to compete with art, with artists in different cities. I feel you. And that's really how I got into doing PR services uh, for artists. Is it too much to do now? Um, it's not my love. I will stay up all night. I will. I just worked with uh, Tony Neal, who is the founder of the Core DJs, and I just did his EPK for him. That's uh, dope. This is someone who people know. People know Tony Neal. He has so many years of accomplishments and accolades under his belt. And to, you know, to be able to work with him. I know that he's in the news right now because Takashi just, did you check that out? Yeah. So Takashi just called Tony Neal out. But one thing that, that you cannot take away from Tony Neal is he has an ear for music. The he has fact, an ear but for the music. Fact, though, because, you know, Takashi nowadays <laughs> is picking and choosing who he wants to beef with. But he knew, <laughs> hey, OG can create a buzz if I talk about yeah. him. So he knew yeah. who to talk about. Yeah. And that's that's dope. But being the man that Tony Neal is, you know, for him to turn around and to, you know, to congratulate Takashi, to congratulate Nicki Minaj, I mean, I think it's just big, that you is. know? And again, you guys are now soundboards. Anyone who's operating a podcast, uh, anyone with a respected, you know, voice and opinion, 
Yes. We are the Tony Neils of the city. Facts. Yeah, we're the Tony Neils. So, so people care. And I could not understand when I was doing the 10 to watch issue. <laughs> you know, I'm glad that this year they kind of, it wasn't as bad as it had been in previous years. But people thought that when I would do my 10 to watch issue, that I was saying that these are the best artists in Wichita. Uh -uh. And that's not what it was. It was me saying that, hey, I think that these people are slept on or they're not getting enough you know, recognition. So these are people who I want you to go and check out. Yeah. So it's like Oprah. That are about their business too. P Oprah gets to do an Oprah's list. Mama yeah. Rossi can't do a tend to watch. <laughs> no, nah, because they so. feel like Mama Rossi's trying to throw shade at other people. Yeah. But it's it, this is the thing that people have yeah, to understand. sit under that shade. We, us, <laughs> us as people that have to do business with other people, yeah. we are very, very cautious with who we do business yeah. with. Yeah. We're going to look at the business moves that you've made. Yeah. We're going to pay attention to all that so think yeah. so make sure that you got your ducks in in, in a row mm -hmm. before you try and question how we have our structure yeah. down mm -hmm. because there's something that we might have seen that we might see a, a crack in your armor yeah. that we might question a little bit and you can't take it offensive yeah. because yeah. if you want to do business with us you also have to take everything into consideration yeah. you can't take self personal no nope. yeah but, it's true and and honestly i encourage anyone with a platform to be very, very careful with what you attach it to. And I'm not saying that in the opinion of blackballing artists or not working with artists who you don't like. I have actually featured in my magazine artists who I don't like their music. It's it's a reality. Yeah, I think I've, you think everybody that I've linked up with, I'm a fan of their music? <laughs> no. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. So there's artists who I don't necessarily care for their music. It ain't never got no play in my car, but I cannot... I yeah, cannot, I the hustle. yeah, I cannot take it. from them their hustle. The fact that they network really well, mm -hmm. I cannot take that from them. And so, you know, being a, a journalist also means you kind of got to interview people who you don't necessarily like. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to interview someone who, uh, you know, who is blatantly disrespectful to me. Um, and that's something that has happened. But yeah, my block my block game is real, real strong. I block hoes. I already know you do. I already know you do. Because to be at the level that you got to, and a lot of people don't realize, you let a lot of stuff slide. You yeah. let a lot of stuff go. And yeah. then you think, you really yeah. think that you're going to say something about me and I ain't going to hear about it. We in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Like, come on now. Like, yeah. it's, it's going to get around soon enough. Yeah. But yeah. I, I told you I don't want to talk about that stuff. <laughs> We're done. I got one final question sure. for you. What's the best advice that you've ever been given? Hmm. The higher that you ascend, you know, you're going to receive constructive criticism. Um, you just you just have to realize that even as we create these lanes and these platforms here locally, even Vibe magazine and Double XL, they get scrutinized. They get constructive criticism you have to be comfortable with that as yeah. as a creative um and the thing is that we're artists too yes you know we're artists too and, we're and sensitive so about our shit. we are sensitive about it right and so uh when artists would when artists would you know talk crap or whatever because they weren't featured in the magazine or whatever you know i i used to be you know, I, I used to be like Meek Mill. I was Twitter fingers, you know? <laughs> and so so I would like, you know, be going back and forth. And I realized, you know, that's taking energy. And then I start realizing that the more that you you have this platform and you have people who are paying attention to you and, and what you're doing and what you're saying, that they will sit here and pick a fight with you because of that's, the attachment. Yep. And I start being smarter about that because I didn't realize that artists was like winning. No, nah, I'm not connected to this person. Yeah, because now they're engaged with me when they don't even exist past your block button. You know, an artist who does not exist past your block button is no artist at all. All right. So you don't hear no one's bringing, you know, hey, have you listened to this track? You know. Um, you don't see them ever performing nope. out at any of the events and stuff. And there's a lot of artists who I have blocked, who I've, I've look, if I ever do see talk them back. Talk that talk. If, Let them know. If I ever do see them back in my news feed, I hate to say it, but I'm like, oh, my God, like, he's still alive or he's still doing music. And it's true. But you like that person, they, you hear somebody mention that person's name, you're like, oh, they're still working. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, it I, is what it is. I know that there's artists who, you know, who think that they've been blackballed by myself or by other people here in town. But again, it's relationship and rapport building. 100%. And either you have it or you don't. 
And if you don't have it, then you really gonna feel blackballed. So. Tijuana, Mama Rossi Harwell. I thank yeah. you so much thank for you. the time that you've given me. I really appreciate it. I look forward to all the future ventures that you have coming up because I know that that big interview is coming. Yeah. And when it does happen, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm looking forward to it. But continue to do what you do. Continue to inspire us that are also in the same field as you. And then just continue to inspire the youth. And that's one thing that I love about you is that you're so active with the youth. Thank you. So thank you for everything that you do for the black community. Thank you for everything that you do for the community. Mm -hmm. And just continue to be that OG that I know you are. Thank you. I appreciate you. And I ain't gonna lie. I hate doing interviews, but I admire what you do so much that thank I absolutely much. had to say yes. So thank you very Thank much. you so much. I appreciate you. And where can they find you? Where can they find all your... So MamaRazziMagazine.com or the Mamarazzi on Facebook or social media anywhere on social media so okay yeah. well thank you very much and ladies and gentlemen this has been an episode of realism with my special guest tijuana mama Razzi hardwell and thank tap you. into mama Razzi magazine because it's really dope and if you want to find out anything that's going on locally she's the queen to get with thank, so, you. thank you i Everybody appreciate much it. love